So if you're new, I'm Nathan Reimer. I'm the lead pastor here at Karis City Church. And I want to come clean on something. I was standing over there looking out at you guys and I got a little emotional at what God has done. Look around at what God has done in just a short period of time. I am so blessed. You guys are a blessing to me. I am so honored and blessed to be your pastor. I just want to say that as we get started. And if I tear up again, just forget it. If I mess up, it's because I was really emotional, not just because I mess up sometimes. Uh, So just keep that in mind as we go through this. We're in the middle of our Easter sermon series called Redeemed, where we're walking our way up through Easter. And so last week, we talked about what Jesus had to say about who he is and what he came to do. And then this week, we're looking at the trial of the cross. And as we go through this, you're going to see some amazing things. And you, but actually, you're going to feel like maybe this sermon feels a little different to you. You're going to be thinking, man, there's something different about this sermon. And you're going to be walking out of the service, and you're going to be thinking, man, there was something a little different about the, the sermon today. And your spouse is going to say, you know, Nathan really didn't beat up and make us feel bad today. And you're going to go, yeah, that's it. I just thought about that. So actually for Lent, I've given up drive-by guilting, so I'm not going to do that. Actually, that's not true. I haven't given that up. I have given something up, but it's not that. But I'm glad you're here today. Um, Seriously, though, there is something different about today's sermon because it's going to be a history of Jesus' arrest, his trials, and leading up to the cross. But And you're going to learn some new stuff, I think, some things you didn't know that's really cool. But if all you take away from this sermon is some new knowledge then you miss the main point of the sermon. Because as we see this trek to the cross, as we see this trial of the cross, it ought to change the way we view Easter. It also ought to change the way we think about our relationship with God. Because when we understand the sacrifice that Jesus made, man, it ought to affect us. It ought to make us emotional. It ought to create a change in us. You know, Jesus actually talked a little about this. and We talked about it a few weeks ago. When Jesus started the Sermon on the Mount, he started out with some Beatitudes. They're these statements that start out, happy or blessed is the person who is, maybe it's merciful or pure in heart, these different things that he would say. The very first one of those in Matthew 5, 3 is, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And what he meant by that is that when we have an understanding of how desperate we are for the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus, we got to be transformed by that. And when we understand the great sacrifice that Jesus had to make so that we could be forgiven and set free, man, we ought to experience a little of the joy of heaven. And so that's what he was talking about is for the people who are poor in spirit and understand what Jesus did, we get a little taste or a little preview of the joy that's coming in heaven. So as we go through this historical account of the trial of the cross, I hope you're changed. I hope you're impacted by that. And I hope you begin to prepare your heart for Easter because today we're heading into that holy week that kicks off with Palm Sunday. And I hope that you're beginning to prepare yourself for Easter. All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to John chapter 18. We're going to kind of bounce back and forth between the books of John and the books of Matthew because each of them focus on different details in this story of the trial of Jesus. So to kind of set this up, Jesus and his disciples have celebrated the Passover and they've had what's called the Lord's Supper. We'll take communion a little later. That was the very first time that happened. And so after dinner, they go out for a walk and they walk to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And as they're there, Jesus is going to be arrested. Let's pick up the story there in John 18, 2 through 6. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So I want you to understand what's happening here at the beginning. They come out to arrest Jesus. They got swords. They've got lots of people. And they get there and they say, who is this? And Jesus says, I'm the person you're looking for. And they drop in fear. 
And it's important to understand that Jesus was in control of that situation. When they all dropped to the ground in fear, Jesus could have got up. He could have walked away. He could have disappeared into the night. Jesus was only arrested because he allowed himself to be arrested. Then after that, things are going to get a little wild. Peter thinks it's a fight. So he grabs a sword and he cuts somebody's ear off. But Jesus calms everything down. He reaches out and he heals the the man's ear that had been cut off. And then Jesus allows himself to be arrested. Now, here's something you may not have known. Because he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's brought back into the city through a gate that would have been known as the Sheep's Gate. So the Garden of Gethsemane is to the east of the city of Jerusalem outside the gates. And so they would have brought him back in through this gate called the Sheep Gate. Now, the Sheep Gate was built about 450 years before Jesus was born by a guy named Nehemiah when the walls were rebuilt after they were destroyed by the Babylonians. Look at how Nehemiah describes that in Nehemiah 3.1. Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the Sheep Gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred. Now, this, sheep is called, this gate is called the Sheep Gate because it led out of the city out to the sheep market where you'd go to buy your sacrificial sheep. So after you bought your sheep, you'd bring it back through the sheep gate, bring it, they would clean it up, they would take it into the temple and sacrifice it. How amazing is that? Is that Jesus came through the same gate after he was arrested as the sacrificial sheep. Because Jesus was a sacrifice. Remember in the Old Testament, these lambs would be sacrificed for the sins of individuals and they would be brought in, cleaned up, and then sacrificed. And Jesus was about to be the sacrifice that paid for sins once and for all, that took care of all of that. He was the sacrifice. But he blew the Old Testament sacrifices out of the water because he was a permanent sacrifice, unlike the temporary sacrifice. But how cool is it that he would have come back into the city through the same gate as the sacrificial sheep, through the sheep gate? You know, there's some historical facts about this moment in time that you can kind of write off as being kind of weird coincidences that just happened. Or you can see the beauty and the planning and the perfection that God made for every moment of this first Easter when Jesus would come back into the city and die for our sins. Jesus was to be a sacrificial lamb. He was the lamb of God. And he's brought back into the city through the same gate as the sheep who were going to be sacrificed. Listen to what John the Baptist said about Jesus being the lamb. This is three years earlier when Jesus is at the, the very beginning of his ministry. John the Baptist says this, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So from the very beginning, he's been referred to as the lamb of God. And then look from last week, we talked about what Jesus said he came to do and who he is. Look at that again. This is John 10, 7 through 11. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. If you don't know, we're the sheep, by the way. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And then he says, we didn't talk about this one last week. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Can you imagine those listeners to Jesus would have thought about the sheep gate when he was talking about that? I'm the gate for the sheep. They're thinking, yeah, that's the sheep gate. And then Jesus is brought through that same gate to go to his trial and to the cross. Now, this is a picture of that gate, the sheep gate. And that's a faraway picture. It was called the sheep gate, but much later on it was renamed to be the lion's gate. And here's why. If you zoom in, there's these carvings of the lion's in that gate. So it was known as the sheep gate when Jesus was brought through it, but later it was known as the lion's gate. Now what's significant about that? There's two animals that Jesus is referred to as in the Bible, a lamb and a lion. So he's brought through a gate that was known as the lamb's gate, but then later after the resurrection, it's changed to be the lion's gate. Listen to what the apostle John says uh, about the future in Revelation 5, 1 through 6. He says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with the seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. 
John says, I wept and I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scrolls and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Jesus is the lamb of God, and he's the lion of Judah. And he came through a gate that was the sheep's gate, but later the lion's gate. Pretty cool stuff. All right, let's keep going. This is John 18, 12 through 14. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commanders and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. So church history tells us that Jesus was brought in through this gate and his hands would have been bound so tightly that it cut through the flesh and went all the way to the bone. And so as he walked through this gate into the city of Jerusalem, his blood would have began to drip as he walked through. And then Jesus was taken to stand trial. We're going to talk about that, but you need to understand there's actually two different kinds of trials that are taking place here. The first is a religious trial by the Jewish leaders. They're going to have an an arraignment, and then they're going to have a trial. We'll talk about that. But then he has to go through a second trial by the Roman governor, a guy named Pontius Pilate, because keep in mind that Israel at this point was a Roman province because they'd been conquered by Rome. And so Romans had to decide serious issues of criminal guilt. All right. So Jesus is first taken to this house. It's late at night, and he's going to be questioned by these religious leaders. This is John 18, 9 through 23. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I've spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in the synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I've said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who have heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? So late at night, he's taken into this house and he's questioned by these Jewish religious leaders. And in modern terms, this would be known as an arraignment where the charges are brought and he's indicted. So he is indicted for claiming to be the son of God. And so after that, Jesus is going to be taken to the house next door. So just across the street to be tried in the formal trial. This is the middle of the night, and Matthew includes a lot more detail about this part of the trial, so we're going to look over at Matthew 26, 59 through 68. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death, but they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said, you have said so. But I say this to all of you. From now on, you'll see the Son of Man. Now, Jesus would often refer to himself as the Son of Man. You'll see him sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? The other said, he is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit on his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? So this is the formal trial by the religious leaders, but there was a lot of mistakes they made. They didn't comply with a whole lot of Jewish law. This was a sham trial. They indict him, then they take him next door, and the same exact people try him. The religious leaders that performed this trial were called the Sanhedrin, and so that's kind of like our modern Supreme Court. They were the highest level of legal authority in the Jewish nation. And they both arraigned him and indicted him, and then they tried and convicted him. And so there's a number of different violations of Jewish law that took place in this trial. The first violation is what I just told you, that the same exact people brought the charges against Jesus, accused Jesus, and then turned around and tried Jesus and convicted him and sentenced him to death. 
The Sanhedrin actually wasn't allowed to bring serious criminal charges against anybody because they would be the ultimate deciders of guilt, innocence, and the punishment. That's the first violation. The second violation is it began in the middle of the night. So this is done in secret where nobody knows what's happening, but Jewish law required that any criminal trial had to take place only during daylight hours. So that's the second violation. Here's the third violation. This trial started very early in the morning on Friday morning. So it's still dark, still in the middle of the night, but it was Friday morning. And you could not have a death penalty case the day before the Sabbath. The Sabbath back then was Saturday. You couldn't start a death penalty case on Friday. And here's why. Another Jewish rule required that before you could sentence someone to death, you had to have a 24-hour cooling off period. So you thought you wanted to convict them, sentence them to death, you had to wait 24 hours to do that. They couldn't do that because they had to get Jesus crucified before the end of Friday. So they violated that law. Another violation is criminal charges and criminal trials had to be done in the temple for all to see. But this was done in a house in secret. So all these different laws were violated when they sentenced and convicted Jesus. It wasn't a fair trial. I mean, there were no defense witnesses even called. I just feel like for the crime of claiming to be the son of God, Jesus could have called some pretty powerful witnesses, couldn't he? Think about it. Maybe he'd have called the woman that he saved from being stoned for committing adultery. And she could have come and testified about his courage, about his truth, and his grace. Maybe he could have called the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, who would have said, Jesus knew stuff about me that nobody knows. No one could have known those things about me unless they were God. And then he forgave me and changed the whole town that I live in. Maybe Jesus could have called somebody he'd healed. He'd healed lepers, people from blindness, from, from, from being paralyzed. He could have called any one of those people to talk about how he had power over sickness and death. Probably would have called his buddy Lazarus, who could have said that not only does Jesus have power over sickness and death, but that he raised Lazarus from the dead after he'd been in the tomb for four days. Maybe Jesus could have called one of the thousands of people that were there when he took just a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread and fed all of them. And they could have talked about the great power of Jesus. But no witnesses were called in this trial. Jesus was convicted in a sham trial, and then he was sentenced to death. The proceedings weren't fair, but you know that actually makes sense. Because Jesus came in the very first place to pay the price of sins that he had never committed. Listen to how the Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Here's what that's saying. God clothed Jesus with all of our sin, everything we've ever done, so that we could be clothed with his righteousness. He, he came to pay the price of sin he didn't commit, so it was never set up to be fair. So it only makes sense. That's what Easter's all about, right? I want you to just imagine this scene at this religious trial. Jesus is standing there. He's bloody. He's beaten. Probably had blood just running down him from being hit over and over and over. He's tired. He's been up for many hours at this point in time. He's surrounded by powerful men that want him dead. And yet when they say, are you the son of God? Listen to what he says. From now on, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. He's bold. He says, here is who I am. Imagine how that must have seemed to those religious leaders. Would have felt silly, right? Outrageous that this guy that's bound and bleeding is claiming to be divine. But what Jesus did three days later made those claims seem a lot less silly. When you walk out of your grave, you are what, who you say you are. Here's what I really struggle with about what these Jewish religious leaders did. They, they accused and convicted Jesus for blasphemy, for falsely claiming to be the son of God. But do you know what they never even really considered? Is that he might be the son of God. Because if he is in fact the son of God, then it wasn't blasphemy. He spoke truth. Those religious leaders had heard some of his teaching. Many of them had seen some of his miracles or at least heard the stories of those miracles by people who had come and talked to them. 
And, and keep in mind that the Jewish nation had been waiting for a Messiah. They'd been waiting for this moment for thousands of years. And, and yet here they are with all that evidence right before them, and, and they missed it. They missed out on who Jesus was. And, and I think I know what happened. I, I don't think it was a lack of evidence that caused them to miss Jesus. I think they didn't want to give up control. These were the most powerful men in the Jewish nation. They had lots of respect and lots of authority. And if Jesus arrives and he is, in fact, God, well, that cuts into their authority. Like, if Jesus walks through that door right now, I'm taking off the mic and giving it to him. It's his. And those guys knew that if Jesus was praised as God, it would take away much of their respect and their authority. They were scared of change. They didn't want to give that up. And, and so they ignored everything in front of them and sent the God of the universe to die on a cross like a common criminal. They missed it. But you know what? It sounds a little odd to us, but the exact same thing happens 2,000 years later. We say we don't believe and people will refuse to follow Jesus because they don't believe. But I think it's a lot less about the lack of evidence supporting that Jesus is who he says he is and more about our pride and our arrogance because we don't want to give up control. I said last week that if you actually examine the evidence that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead three days later, that it actually takes more faith to stay an atheist than it does to follow Jesus. The problem generally is not a lack of evidence. It's we don't want to give up control. We sure don't want Jesus to tell us to stop doing some things we know he wouldn't approve of. And so we say we don't believe. But it's not a lack of evidence. It's pride and arrogance. We don't want things to change. We're doing the exact same thing that those religious leaders did. We just don't want Jesus messing up the way things are. We want to be the boss of us. We want to be God for ourselves, even though we know deep down we are horrible gods. We just don't do it very well. Look back at verse 65 at what the high priest does when Jesus claims to be the son of God. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. So the high priest tears his clothes. And when he does that, he violates Jewish law for a high priest. He actually violates his own oath of office. Look back in Leviticus 21.10. Here's the law that Caiaphas violates. The high priest, the one among his brothers who has the anointing oil poured on his head and who's been ordained to wear the priestly garments, must not let his hair become unkempt or tear his clothes. In that moment, Caiaphas violates one of the laws of his office because he gets so upset about what Jesus has done. Now, ripping or tearing of the clothes was a traditional mourning uh, event for Jewish people. If, if someone died, you might tear your clothes as a sign of, of serious mourning. But it was also a sign of serious anger. If you were really upset, you'd tear your clothes to show how angry you were. But the high priest was not allowed to engage in this kind of emotional outburst. He was prohibited from that. And so what we're seeing here is some beautiful symbolism. It's subtle, but it's very important. We're seeing the lesser priest, Caiaphas, giving way to the superior priest in Jesus. What we're seeing here is symbolism of a bigger truth. When Jesus died on the cross and he rose on the third day, we don't need priests anymore. We don't need the sacrifice of animals. Jesus, in that moment, became the high priest for every single one of us. And he's all the priests we need. Look at how Hebrews 7, 23 through 27 says this. Now, there have been many of these priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our needs, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priest, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. That's what's being portrayed here with Caiaphas tearing his clothes. Is he's giving way, without knowing it, to the high priest in Jesus. And here's the reality for us today. You don't need me to get to Jesus. I am not your high priest. I'm a pastor. I'm called to teach. 
I'm called to lead God's church, and I hope I give you some wisdom and truth from the Bible. But your relationship doesn't go through me. Your relationship is directly to Jesus Christ. He is the only priest you need. See, I'm a pastor, but I don't have a more direct connection to God than you do. I don't have a different relationship with God than you do. You can have the exact same relationship because Jesus is the way you get to God. And the way you do that, if you haven't, is you believe this Easter story. You, You believe that Jesus is who he says he is and that he's done what he claims to have done. And then you repent of your sins, and you ask God to be your your Savior and to forgive you. And then you're baptized. That's the way that works. And if you've got questions about that, at the end of this sermon, I'm going to be in the back of the room during invitation. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to follow this priest in Jesus who died to save us all. The religious leaders, they decide to put Jesus to death. But that's not the end of the story, that he has to go through another trial. Remember, there's a Roman governor, and he ultimately gets to be the decider of serious criminal charges. So now Jesus is going to have his second trial with a guy named Pontius Pilate. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You've said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now, it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At the time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him a message, don't have anything to do with this innocent man, For I've suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of these two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but instead an uproar was starting, he took water and he washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's now your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. This trial in front of Pilate was every bit as unfair as the first trial. Because what Pilate did was find no fault in Jesus. Nothing wrong with this man. And yet, he still approved the sentence and sent him to be flogged and beaten and sent to the cross. Here's the problem with Pilate. Pilate liked Jesus. He didn't have a problem with Jesus. But he was worried about the crowd. He he gave in to, he was worried about a riot. And so he chose not having a riot over Jesus. He, He picked safety over Jesus, convenience over truth. Look, he he liked Jesus well enough, but not enough to affect his decision. You know, actually, Pilate was probably mostly ambivalent about Jesus. And and if you think about that, that's a really unusual reaction for Jesus, right? I mean, when Jesus met people in the stories we see in the Bible, there wasn't a lot of ambivalence. The reactions were powerful. They either reacted with love and admiration and loyalty Or they reacted with anger and hatred. But there were very few people that really didn't care. But Jesus, but Pilate didn't care enough to intervene. He wasn't worth, it wasn't worth the risk for him. And so he does something, he washes his hands and says, I wash my hands of this situation. Do you know that's actually where we get that phrase when you're washing your hands of something? It's from Pilate saying, this isn't my, this isn't my deal. This is on you, not me. He was ambivalent. He just didn't care enough to act. And the reality is, some of you are in that same place today. You you like Jesus well enough. You like church. You like things that church do. But you don't care enough to make a decision. Enough to step out and get out of your comfort zone. And decide to follow Jesus and to be baptized. You're ambivalent. But here's the danger that you need to understand. In some ways, being ambivalent 
is the very worst place you can be. Because the danger is you can go all the way through this life and die, never making a decision to follow Jesus. And a decision to not decide is actually a decision to reject Jesus. That's what Pilate did. Here's the truth. Following Jesus isn't easy. It comes with risks and dangers. It's what Pilate saw. <laughs> if I should use Jesus here, I might have a problem on my hands. And so he took the easy route. The early Christians, they went through all kinds of hardship and trouble. They were beaten and jailed for following after Jesus. But they did it anyway. And the reality is there's still risks and dangers to following Jesus, even 2,000 years later. And ultimately, you may have to decide, are you going to be followers of comfort and convenience and safety, or are you going to be followers of Jesus? See, safety is not about being a Christian. But if you think about it, we were not called to safety. We were called to follow Jesus. That's our calling. It's way safer to not follow Jesus, but we are called to get out of our comfort zone, to take a stand for Jesus. I think about this like ships. Where are ships the most safe? When they're in the harbor, right? They're protected from the storms and the waves and all the hardships of the open ocean. But ships were not created to sit in the harbor. They were created to brave the ocean, to, share across, to sail across the seas, to do a job. Don't choose a life of safety over a life of Jesus. We have this incredible adventure we've been offered to make an eternal difference in the world around us. And we can either choose safety and convenience or we can choose to follow Jesus. See, Jesus knew it wasn't always going to be easy. That's why he said, following me is like carrying your cross. And this cross we're talking about is what he was referring to. See, Jesus' trial of the cross was all about his great love for you. At, at this point, when Jesus was headed to the cross, he, he could have called on 10,000 angels to rescue him. He could have struck down all his accusers and simply walked away. But he chose to go to the cross because nothing less than the cross would have solved our problem of sin. He made that decision out of his great love for us. For those of you that aren't followers of Jesus, that have been kind of just checking out this church thing here at Karis City, here's the way you prepare your heart for Easter. You make a decision to follow after this Jesus that died for you. You, you make a decision to give your life to him. Look, I, I don't know what your failures are. I, I don't know what your sins are. Maybe your failures and sins are pretty spectacular and lots of people know about them. Or, or maybe you've done a pretty good job of covering it all up and hiding it. Or, or maybe you're in a place where you're thinking, you know, my life's pretty good. But deep down, you know something's missing. The way you prepare for Easter is you allow the cross and what Jesus did to change you, to transform your life. See, here's why that's so important. The, the Bible tells us that God is so holy and so righteous that he can't stand our sin. He's angry about it. And that anger is actually directed at you. But what Jesus did on the cross is he took on all of that anger, all of that frustration of God, all that wrath of God that we don't like to talk about much in church. He took that on himself so that you could be forgiven. But you have to make the final decision. I, I've heard it said that if a thousand steps separate us from God, Jesus took the first 999, but you've got to take the last one. You've got to choose to follow Jesus. Not making a decision is actually making a decision to reject Jesus. We're going to look at John 3, 16 through 18. A lot of you guys know John 3, 16, but you may not know the next two verses. Here's what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. If you're not a Christian, don't miss out on Easter. Don't miss out on what Jesus has done so that you can be saved by grace through faith. 
For those of us that are already Christians, we need to prepare ourselves for Easter as well. We, we've given you some help. If you look in the seat uh, you're in or next to you, you're going to find a little prayer card. And as we go into this holy week leading up to Easter, we've given you a different prayer and a little scripture for certain days that you can read. But I, but I want to challenge you to prepare for Easter. Pray these prayers. Starts tomorrow with asking for forgiveness of your sin. That's the starting point. Have time as a family. God just showed up. <laughs> Have time as a family to talk about what the cross means, what Easter means. We've got a good Friday service this Friday here in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. If you missed the last one, man, you don't want to miss this one. It's a good time getting our hearts ready for Easter. But, but the bottom line is this. Don't walk through this holy week leading to Easter with this kind of, I've heard it all before, I've seen it all before, kind of blasé attitude. We should be emotional about the cross. We should be emotional about what Jesus did for us and how that changes our life and changes our eternity. Now, I want to kind of wrap up by looking at Isaiah 53, 4 through 6. I'm going to look at the message paraphrase. This is just a modernization of that original language of what it was saying. But keep in mind, this is prophecy about Jesus and what he'd do on the cross. But it was written hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. Listen to this. But the fact is, it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. We thought he brought it on himself, that God was punishing him for his own failures. But it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him. Our sins. He took the punishment, and that made us whole. Through his bruises, we get healed. We're all like sheep who've wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing, gone our own way, and God has piled all our sins, everything we've done wrong, on him, on him. Here's the reality. My sin sent Jesus to the cross. Your sin sent Jesus to the cross. We're as responsible for Jesus having to die on the cross as the Roman soldier that took the hammer and the nail and drove it through his hands and his feet. Wasn't fair, wasn't right, but Jesus did it willingly because he knew that nothing short of the cross would be enough. And so what Jesus did when he suffered and died on the cross is he nailed our failure to the cross. He nailed our sin to the cross so that it died with him when we choose to follow after Jesus. And when I talked early about how we should prepare for Easter, this is it. We have to remember that Jesus willingly went to the cross so that we could be forgiven and set free. That's Easter. Let's pray.